Edials are the second step on our trek up Rome's Cursus Honor. They are unique in that they were an optional step. It was possible to move directly from Quester to Praetor, but there was a potential nine-year gap between the two positions. The future leaders of Rome needed to build their resumes. We talked about Questers before, and you may remember that they were relegated to being second in command to more powerful politicians. This was not the case with Edile. Unlike Questers, serving as an Edile was an excellent platform from which to build a political brand. The position could not be a mandatory step on a political career, since there were only four open positions on any given year. Becoming an Edile was a particularly good career move for a populist politician, since the nature of the job involves direct day-to-day -day contact with the lower classes. Hold up, we're getting ahead of ourselves. First, what did Edile's even do? The popular conception of Edile's is something along the lines of an elected religious official, but that is way off the mark. The Romans had pontiffs who were totally separate and different, and did their own thing. Ediles were much more. The word edile can literally be translated as temple builder, which gives you a clearer idea of how the job began. Speaking as generally as possible, ediles attended to public life within the city of Rome. That's such a broad description that it's almost meaningless, so let's get a little bit more specific. Even though the name means temple builder, Ediles didn't actually have to build temples anymore. Anybody was allowed to build a temple. Private citizens, the Roman Senate, anybody. The Ediles were the ones responsible for the upkeep of those temples once they were built. What does upkeep even mean? At this point you might be thinking to yourself, temple maintenance? Why would people even fight over this job? It was a bigger deal than you might think. For instance, the Temple of Saturn functioned as Rome's treasury. The Temple of Castor and Pollux was Rome's Senate House. There wasn't really such thing in ancient Rome as government buildings, but temples were the closest thing they had. But it didn't really stop at government buildings or temples. Edals also had to oversee the baths, which were these giant architectural works of genius open to the public. There is really no modern equivalent. Most citizens, unless they were dirt poor, made a trip to the baths in the middle of the day. It was a huge part of Roman social life. And these bath complexes eventually grew out to include rooms for such things as weightlifting, wrestling, dice games, board games, libraries, restaurants, shopping centers, tons of stuff. Just running the public baths could have been a full-time job. Consistent supply of fresh water was essential in order to have well-functioning bathhouses, which meant that the Edals were also responsible for the maintenance of the aqueducts, which were amazing feats of engineering in their own right. They didn't just oversee the city's water, but its food, too. Cheap or free bread was bought and given out as part of a government program, and Edals were responsible for making this happen. They had the monumental task of securing a steady supply of grain for the city, storing it in government warehouses, and stockpiling enough to last through the winter. I won't go on about this for any longer, but I think you get my point. Most of the day-to-day -day things that we would normally associate with municipal government were overseen by the EDOs. In the minds of the people actually serving in these offices, everything I just mentioned probably took up like 40% of their brain power. Honestly, their main concern was the fact that the EDOs were in charge of the festivals and the public holidays. This was the big draw for becoming an EDIL, and it's why they have this undeserved reputation as religious officials. To put on the public festivals, the state granted the Edals a modest annual budget, but over time, it just became customary for the Edals to supplement that budget with their own private wealth. Julius Caesar borrowed and spent several fortunes just to be elected Edal. He borrowed and spent several more fortunes to put on some of the most lavish games on record. He was an ambitious guy and determined to make a name for himself. Let me give you one example of him trying to stir up some controversy in his time as Edile. This requires a bit of context, but I promise it's worth it. When Caesar was a teenager, there was a civil war between two men named Sulla and Marius. Sulla was an aristocratic conservative who wanted to restore the rights of the Senate and the upper classes. Marius was a low-born populist who believed in the power of the more democratic popular assemblies. Or anyways, this is what the two men said to justify their actions. In practice, they were both nakedly ambitious men, and by the end of the Civil War they had each done the unthinkable and stormed the city of Rome at the head of an army. In the end, Sulla and the Conservatives won, 
but it was a deeply traumatizing experience for the Romans. I omitted one key piece of information. Marius was Caesar's uncle by marriage. When Sulla captured Rome for the final time, there were death lists published, scores being settled, and general chaos on the streets. Sulla had almost all of Caesar's wealth confiscated, simply because of his family connections. Caesar, fearing for his life, was forced to flee the city for many years. Flash forward to when Caesar had nearly bankrupted himself in order to become Edai. What does he do with this new power? Remember how I said the Edals were basically responsible for most public buildings and temples? Well, Caesar secretly had an order issued for all of the tributes and honors and trophies to be restored to his uncle Marius all around the city. This happened in the dead of night with nobody noticing. When people woke the next day and saw the tributes to Marius on the temples and the monuments, they were outraged. Or more specifically, the Senate was outraged. One senator in particular accused him of assaulting the Republic with a battering ram. But the people actually loved it. Marius was one of them, and the Sulla years had been bad years anyways. People were ready to start romanticizing the defeated Marius. With that, literally overnight, Caesar established himself as a political brand unto himself. Caesar was now officially a populist, just like his uncle. He even bought a house on the Aventine Hill in the poor part of the city, away from the other senators. After this, Caesar really wanted to hit it out of the park for the big Roman games, which happened in September. He borrowed and spent even more than usual, and put on massive public feasts, exotic beast battles, and extravagant gladiatorial contests. These were especially controversial. Caesar reportedly had huge numbers of gladiators shipped to the city from all over, all of whom were outfitted in silver armor and the finest weapons money could buy. Honest to God, the Senate thought that he was preparing to overthrow the government. He had them that freaked out over his little Marius stunt. They even passed a law saying that no man could have more than 300 gladiators in the city at one time. Our sources specifically say that Caesar had 320 during this time, so either someone's count is off, or Caesar was deliberately dipping his toe over the line just to put the senate's nose out of place. During his tumultuous year as Aedile, he shared much of his responsibilities and expenses with his co-Aedile, Bibulus. In essence, they put on these games together. Bibulus told a joke at the time. Remember how I mentioned that the Senate officially met in a place called the Temple of Castor and Pollux? Castor and Pollux were the so-called Divine Twins. But people being people, and laziness being laziness, in everyday speech it was usually just shortened to the Temple of Castor. Bibulus joked that the joint aedileship of Caesar and Bibulus, like the Temple of Castor and Pollux, was simply known as the aedileship of Caesar. In other words, Bibulus was upset that Caesar was getting all the credit. He saw Caesar as an egoist, and over time began to cultivate a healthy hatred towards the man. This is not the last time we will hear from Bibulus. He plays a big role in Caesar's life later on. I'll continue to track his career in the videos ahead. I'll end with this. Remember from the Quester video how Cicero was such a good lad during his service in Sicily? He gave the landowners a fair shake regarding the grain shipments, and in return secured a cheap and stable supply for Rome. Well, during his aedileship, he could not afford to spend nearly as lavishly as Caesar, or really any other aedile. He was a newly minted aristocrat from an undistinguished provincial family, who basically got where he was from raw personal talent. He had no family wealth or political favors to cash in. Luckily, his new clients or allies in Sicily saw this and came to his rescue. During the important festivals in Cicero's year as Aedile, his new Sicilian friends were good enough to flood Rome with a wide variety of free food for the public. People described Cicero's festivals as tasteful and modest, which honestly is not a compliment. But people generally gave him a pass because of his extravagant feasts, which were offered free of charge to the poor. His political contacts from his time as quester saved him from disaster, and his Aedileship was generally considered a success, 